This podcast contains strong language and adult themes. Listener's discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to A Page Too Far, the show where each week one of us reads a book and then tells the other all about it. Will it be bad? Will it be good? Let's find out. Hello, I am an anti-vaxxer, and my co-host tonight is a six-year-old dying of tetanus. Help me! That's all I got. I, <laughs> it's not a very good one to work with, I no, admit. Uh, you don't get like a tetanus shot until you're like 12, right? <laughs> I don't actually know. I think that's when I got my first tetanus shot. It could be. I, well, you can get tetanus before you're 12, though. That's true. I feel like you would. that would be one of the things you get when you're like two. Maybe. Maybe it is. And then maybe it just needed like. Cause well, you do need boosters. Yeah, yeah, you do need boosters. So maybe that's so. what it was. Maybe I did get yeah. it when I was young. And I, I have obviously no recollection of that. I used to do a thing when I was uh, when I was like a toddler getting vaccinated and getting my shots and all of that. Uh-huh. Where uh, I hated needles at the time. I'm fine now. Shots are fine. Whatever. Right. Yeah. But at the time, I was so scared of needles that I would clench my muscles and the doctors wouldn't yeah, be like, able to, like the needle would bend. <laughs> right. Yeah. Not because, not because I'm a superhuman, but because babies are strong and needles kind of aren't. Right. No, the needles are not made to stand up to any exactly. kind of, exactly any kind of resistance because that's how you hurt people. Yeah. And I, yeah, I was the same. I was, um, I had to be held down to get yeah. vaccinated because I hated needles and like, I'm fine with needles now for the most part. The one thing I can't do is like give blood. Oh, interesting. That freaks me the fuck out. It's, you a, can, it's a different experience for sure. Right. But it's not that it's painful or weird. It's just the thought of someone taking, like even getting cut open and bleeding. That means nothing to me. Right. Because it, it happened. But giving blood is like you are taking something that is your life essence. Right. And, and it, somebody is intentionally withdrawing it. It's like a weird powerlessness yeah, that yeah, I yeah. can't get over. But I mean, you can inject whatever you want to me and I'm fine. Interesting. It's just that if someone is literally take if, if there's a tube in my arm and yeah, my blood is yeah. going through that tube, I can't do that. That's funny. And I feel terrible because donating blood is important. Right. Yeah, exactly. But that's just like one of that's like my one phobia is like, I can't fucking do that. Uh, so, I mean, normally I'd ask how you're doing, but you're a six year old dying of tetanus. So not, not Life great. Life kind of sucks right now. Yeah. Tetanus is scary, man. Yeah, it is. You get locked on. You can't fucking eat anymore. Yeah. Ugh. It's horrifying. Uh, like rabies making you afraid of water. So I was very excited about the book I'm going to talk about. We have a story about this book. There is a story. Uh, so this week's book is Zabiba and the King by Saddam Hussein. Uh-huh. The one and only. The man, the myth. Yes. May Allah protect and keep him. Um, so I was... <laughs> I don't think that worked out so well. <laughs> That's literally written in the front of the book, so yeah, I, I just had to say that. Yeah. Um, so a mutual friend of ours... Yes told me about this book just you just me and i said i I told him not to tell you about it specifically and he didn't he didn't except we both frequent the same uh social media platform known as reddit yeah and we both saw me and this mutual friend saw this post about this book and decided that would be a good one for the show yeah apparently so i when i so the, the when we recorded after this before that i told you i have i ordered a book off amazon yep and I'm so excited about it. I didn't look at the synopsis. I didn't look up anything about it. I just saw the author's name, and that's why I bought it. Yep. And then you said, it was it written by Saddam Hussein? <laughs> and that's I was exactly like, how that went. And I was like, oh shit. And you you had also ordered the book, and I felt really bad because we nah. try to keep we try to keep these books secret from each we other. We do. You, usually, we don't know what the other person is reading, or we'll know like the title, but not what it's about, or something like that. Right. And so that was an that was inevitable. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah, it was going to happen where we, we duplicated books at some point. There's one that we almost duplicated that I'll be doing next week, but we kind of clarified that one a little bit. But mm-hmm. this is uh, this is the first time, and it will not be the last. Probably not, no. No. Um, but you were gracious enough or evil enough to allow me to, <laughs> to read it. That's no, okay. You can read it. So yeah, uh, Zabiba the King by Saddam Hussein. This book was edited by Robert Lawrence. This guy, he, he's called an editor because he's the one who had it translated mm-hmm. and printed into book form. And he has editor's notes throughout the whole book about certain translation errors and stuff like that, or just tidbits about um, Iraqi culture, that sort of thing. Editor's notes are like top notch. Nice. Good on you, Martin Lawrence. <laughs> so I forgot his actual name. Robert Lawrence. Robert Lawrence. Uh, just call him Bobby Law. There you go. That's it. 
Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. It's just Bobby Law. That's I would love to be called that's Bobby Law. That's a great name. <laughs> uh, so this book is uh, technically it's a period romance. Right. That's not what it is. But that is what it is technically That's classified. what it is classified as because that was the author's intent. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it's not the author. Whatever. That's what it's it's paraded as. That is what the facade of the book portends. Yes. Uh, in reality, it's political and religious propaganda to the nth degree. <laughs> and it is impossible to enjoy any of the neutral aspects of this book because it is so fucking manipulative. <laughs> Oh. Uh, so it was published in the year 2000. You telling me Saddam Hussein was manipulative? He was. I don't believe it. Apparently. Uh, it was published in the year 2000. Uh, and then this uh, this edition, made by the editor, translated into English, was published in 2004. Interesting. 2000. Okay. It's 192 pages long. Not too bad. Uh, so I want to talk about some things before we jump into the book. Uh, I want to talk about the book itself, because I have it physically right here in front you of me. do. So... <laughs> It's it's very very boring. It is it is just a red background with a portrait of Saddam Hussein on a white like uh, white headshot kind. Yeah, of. yeah. It's like uh, it, it's it's like a fucking Looney Tune. He's just looking through a round porthole with an abyss behind him. And I can't. T- it does. You're right. It does look like except it's a white abyss instead of a, like the black abyss. Right. Him. But I can't decide if that's an actual picture that is just poorly printed or if it is a painting because it looks like it could be either one. Oh no, it's definitely a picture. It is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think this was toward the end of his life. Makes sense. Um. I mean, it was 2000, right? Right. Yeah. And it, and it's. I think it's made to be as plain as possible because the editor didn't want to glorify this piece of work. Right. He just, the reason he had it translated and published is out of just morbid curiosity. Interesting. Yeah. And and he uh, makes some statement about proceeds going to something or other. So like, they're, right, they're, yeah, the, the, he make he. I, I did read the back of it. He did make a a very important point that Saddam Hussein nor his descendants or anything like that. Um, right, they don't profit off the book. Hey, and Kuse, I think. Why do I know that? I don't know. Um, they don't make any profit off of this book. It is the editor and the publisher who make the profit, not yeah. any questionable entities. Right. So, yeah, the book is just really plain and boring, and I don't like it. I wish it had something better. It needs um, more. It, the original book did have a beautifully painted cover for it. Oh. Of, like, a stereotypical romance novel. Okay. It was, like, like, a, it was a, like, Romeo and Juliet in a rose garden or something like that? Well, it was just, like, some beautiful woman in lavish clothing walking through a palace garden. Fair that, enough. That's what it was. Um, and I was wondering, I was like, why didn't the guy just, I mean, I would prefer having that version. Right. Right. Instead of just a picture of Saddam Hussein that you have to justify. Right. I found out the reason that he didn't use that cover is because that is, uh, art that Saddam stole for his book. Oh, and so it's like all copyright infringement yes. and all of that. That's fascinating. And the, the artist the worst is, crime of all that Saddam Hussein committed. Yeah. And, and the artist is like, fuck, no, you can't use my art for a book by Saddam Hussein. <laughs> huh? Like I wouldn't have allowed it in the first place if I'd even known about it. But I mean, it's in a different country. So what, do you, what can you do? I mean, do? yeah, there's no way you can. If you put art out there, there's no way that you can monitor it 100% of the time. Right. So we're kind of stuck with this cover. And he looks like, if you look at his eyes, he almost looks scared. Looks like he's just about to cry. Yeah, exactly. He look, he's like, got this, I don't know what it is. I feel like this was a very bad time in his life. Um, not that I feel bad for him he's, or anything, but. You know, you know, no, but you know how you see, like you see someone who's about to cry and their eyes look like they're just starting to fill with tears and you yeah. can kind of see they get a little, a little moister than normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it looks like. Yeah, and he has. He looks like he knows that someone is coming to kill him, and he can't yeah. do anything about it. He does. He does have a great salt and pepper beard, though. I'll give him that. His beard game is on point. Uh, so let's jump into the book. The book begins with the author uh, talking about how awesome Iraq is. Oh, and I'm going to try my damnedest to say Iraq because that is correct, not Iraq, which. I was indoctrinated as a kid to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is Iraq. Indoctrinated is not the right word, but growing up with Bush as president, that's all you ever heard was Iraq. <laughs> or, yeah, Iraq. We we're talking about Iraq over there. Yeah. So, that's my Bush impression, which I, <laughs> I've i never actually worked on at all. <laughs> you should. And I, I haven't seen any f- footage of Bush talking in probably 20 years. When I was researching for this book, I was watching footage of Bush right. from that period during the Iraq war. And... It transported me like nothing Hmm. has in a long time. And I don't know what I think it was because like 
in the very early 2000s, there was some like quality to news footage. There's a very distinct type of yeah. sound. It's like when they were first switching to digital or something. Yes, like that. yes, yes. So it's like a very distinct type of video in the audio. And, and, it, and it, like if there's no sound, the audio would crank up. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. as soon as you start talking, it would compress. And it was like that type of digital media just transports me back to that time, it's like, like watching, the turn of the century. Like watching AFV and all those home videos. And yeah. You, like you can tell they were filmed on the box cameras that go on somebody's shoulder yeah, and yeah. have VHS tapes to Yeah. So like watching watching footage of Bush talk about Saddam just made me feel like I was eight years old again. <laughs> it was wow. so weird. That's it was very weird. That's incredible. Yeah. So the book starts with the author just talking about how awesome Iraq is. Uh, Iraq is Iraq. You combined the, uh, I did. the pronunciations That's, there. Okay. Iraq is the land of prophets. Okay. Uh, the birth of civilization. I've heard that. Uh, the land of purity. Okay. Basically, everything good comes from Iraq. Right. Uh, <laughs> the author, which is presumably Saddam, claims that half of the wonders of the world uh, are in Iraq, which is wrong. I feel like that's just blatantly not true. I, he, I'm pretty sure he was including the pyramids of Egypt. And <laughs> well, I mean, I laugh, but if you, it's close. If you consider it all, if you're in the mindset of a world leader like that, and you consider it your territory, right? You're going to use the point of view that it's your territory, right? But technically, not true at all, right? <laughs> so, um, there's also a thing in here about if Iraq didn't exist, then neither would the sun or the moon. I don't understand. Hmm. I don't understand that part. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if that is religious connotation. I don't like know. It's saying the moon and the sun were birthed out of Iraq or something like that. Maybe I, I don't. I don't know enough to. This is a, just a theory. I don't. I don't right. know about this. But and um, he also says uh, that uh, it's the place where Adam and Eve and Abraham and Noah came from. Uh, which I don't know if that's quite right. I've heard that as well. And. I think Iraq extended into part of Mesopotamia where they were supposed to allegedly yeah, to but live. not exactly on the Fertile Crescent. Right. And we know, I think, we know where Mount Ararat is. Right. And I believe it is in Iraq. I'm going to fact check the, <laughs> where Mount Ararat. I just spoke for like 10 seconds on complete potential bullshit. I mean, yeah, that's what we do here. It is what we do here. It's, all, it's what we're all about. Uh, Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat's in Turkey. Okay. Okay. So it's the, it's in. Well, I mean, it's Asia Minor, right? It's in the same neighborhood, but that's still not that's still Iraq. not Iraq. But also, again, if he thinks it is Iraq, or, or he, should be Iraq, yeah, right. It's, that's what I think is his mindset. Is this should all be Iraq because this so, was Iraq a thousand years ago? Maybe. Yeah. So, I'm not so that good we, we we own this, right? So he that that's his mindset pretty much through this book. I can that knowing what I do about Saddam Hussein, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the narrator then tells us, uh, of a wise old woman in his village who tells amazing stories. She tells us the story of Zabiba and the king. Let me tell you a tale of a far off place where the caravan camels roam. I don't recognize that song. It's from Aladdin. Is it? Yeah. I watched that maybe twice in my whole life. Wow. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Uh, I'm, you Williams. know what? I just, I'm not that into it. I mean, hey, that's fine. Just weirdly, I've, everybody loves that. I'm just not that into it. The king was a good man. Nice. Devoted to Allah. Okay. And uh, respected by his people. Oh, good for him. Uh, other kings submitted to him, either out of goodwill or by force. That's fair. Uh, so he wanted to be king of the whole world, eventually. Naturally. Right? Which. Tell me a king that doesn't. I mean, okay. He's. <laughs> He's referred to throughout the book as a good, wise king. And then it just throws a shit ton of reasons at you why he's not a good, wise king. Oh. So, for one, if a man wants to rule the world, he shouldn't. Every I believe that. wants to <laughs> rule the world. That was off key. That was horrible. That was really bad. But I think that if you're the type of person who wants to rule everything, right. you are exactly the person that should not rule everything. Right, right. But that's who he is. He wants to rule everything. Um, eventually. Uh, at this point in the story, the old woman just stops and starts doing chores. We, have, we haven't even gotten into the story, and she's already stopped her story. <laughs> hey, there was a king once. Sweep. Sweep. Yeah. Sweep. And, 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 and I didn't really say it, but the, the narrator is a small child in this scenario hearing the story from the young woman. The, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So the, the old woman that is talking. Yeah. Is someone the narrator knew who told the story to Back him. Back in the day. Supposedly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, 
And so she just starts doing fucking random chores yeah. and doesn't and just ends the story, even though she didn't even begin the fucking story. And then the narrator wonders what the story could mean. <laughs> I well, don't know. You have but, zero context there. Exactly. It's like, how are you supposed to derive meaning from there was a king who wanted to rule everything? Okay. The, the narrator then makes a comment about if if only television could give us one hundredth of the education that the old storytellers did. Hey, it does. It does. Have you ever watched Animal Planet? Or, I don't know, like, there's a lot of educational shit on TV, dude. What are you talking about? Plus, the TV doesn't just tell you that a guy is a good king and he wants to rule shit and then ends. That's true. That doesn't happen on TV. Beginning, middle, end. So then the old lady then continues her story mm -hmm. after she okay. does her chores, I guess. Nice. Uh, it's like later into the evening. Uh, the king becomes lonely and travels away from his palace. Oh, no. Right. Poor king. Lonely soul. Lift uh, your head up. Your crown is slipping. Literally, he soon finds a palace that is slightly smaller than his own. Oh. Uh, and it's owned by a rich merchant. He's compensating for something. The merchant's name is Hiskill. I have heard that name before. It's either Hiskill or Haskell because it's spelled differently depending on who you talk to. The old woman uh, stops her storytelling again to complain about how much rich people suck. She cannot stay on topic here. That's true, but I can get behind that. I mean, I get her. I totally get yeah, that. That's that's one that I'm like, okay, old lady, you're on something here. Uh, she then reminisces about being married to her cousin. Well, and you lost me. <laughs> until the narrator asks her to return to the story. <laughs> <laughs> so in this piece of fiction, the narrator is talking to somebody and he has to get them back on track. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's like, could you just please tell the story? Come that's on. Incredible. Uh, the king does not talk to his skull, but instead goes to a small shack near the fence on the outer edge of the property, right? Okay. Uh, out of the hut, I said shack and then changed it to hut. Yeah. It's a fucking hut, whatever. Uh, out of the little hut comes a beautiful woman. Oh. Her name is Zabiba, and next to her is standing an old man. The inside of the hut was very clean and orderly. Oh, nice. Uh, Zabiba spoke to the king with dignity and respect. Wow. Her words calmed his lonely soul. The king visits her many times more until she is then visiting him at the palace. Oh, man. Um, serious, huh? By the way, they're both married. Oh. The king has wives and a queen and well, Zabiba has a husband. The king makes sense that he has wives because that was totally a thing. Right. Probably still is. I hate it. I do, too. Um, that Maybe I should take the moment to say that uh, on this show, we have a lot of books that are filled with misogyny and in some cases just like horrible racism and shit. Yeah. And we do not condone anything that the characters believe or the author may believe. No. Not We're not down with that. Um, but just forewarning, this book is filled with violence against women and misogyny. So. And it really shows a lot about the author. I mean, we know for a fact. It's that the Saddam author Hussein. Was, what the, the author fuck was do you expect? Head. Yeah. <laughs> like. We are not. We may joke about books and, and situations, things like that, but we are never taking lightly the actual suffering and the actual. Right. No, we're, we're trying to take something shitty and turn it into entertainment. Right. And, you know, sometimes that doesn't always work, but we try our best. But just so you know, this this book, <laughs> it, it's going in that direction. So, yeah. So this uh, this lady, Zabiba, is visiting the king at his palace now. Uh, and the king begins to fall in love with Zabiba. Mm -hmm. uh, but he wouldn't tell her um, because they're both married. Right. It's not right. Right. They're just visiting each other every day. Yeah. They're just. But how how dare you they're just say friends. anything about it? They're just friends. But they're not. They're really good friends in like a historical sense. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. he had his ashes intermingled with. <laughs> what is yeah. there's there were there I, I forget their names but there were two Greek heroes who had their had their ashes intermingled because they wanted to remain together for eternity and history dubbed them as they're just friends. Yeah. They're really good friends. The narrator then goes on for a whole page talking about how the most important part in a relationship is the woman's mouth. What? <laughs> is is this that she must speak honestly and keep secrets? Th yes. This is more about the way she speaks to her husband. Okay. And the way she speaks about her husband. Right. Because both are very good indicators. But I... Am not down with this part of the book at all because he is literally putting all the responsibility of the relationship on the woman. Right. Yeah. The husband can do whatever he wants as long as yes. the wife backs him up. Yes. That's exactly. Th that's the whole culture throughout this whole book. Right. Is that it's 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 on women. Like if like adultery is super super bad and yeah. is harshly punished. Yeah. But if the dude is the one initiating it, 
Eh, whatever. I mean, the guy has multiple wives already. Yeah, it's just, it's normal. So, th- yeah, that, but I, it's just, when I try to summarize it, that's how I put it out. And I was like, that doesn't sound like what it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> like the mouth of the woman is the most important part of a relationship. Um, the king instructs the guards to allow Zabiba to entrance into his private chambers whenever she arrives, right? Okay. He makes them wear their fancy uniforms whenever nice. she comes around. Yes, got to put out the fine china. Uh, and then he tells them to open the gate. Both doors simultaneously, so that neither door moves faster than the other. Insecure much? I mean, I just have them do that anyway, because that just looks cool. <laughs> it's a fucking door. I wouldn't give a shit. No, um, when, you, when you open into like a throne room, you know, you know the scene in the movie where the hero like bursts right. in the throne room and both, room, both doors open at the same time? I guess It'd be it would lame look, if it was just one. It would be weird if one was just a little slower. Yeah. yeah, that would be weird. I get it. But I would make it a permanent thing, not just for her. I would make it a mechanical thing. So that I mean, no, that's matter, no matter what, like, it's it will be happen. the same rate. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, the story that the old woman is telling takes place in uh, 7th or 8th century uh, AD. Okay. So a long time ago, yeah. according to the story. One of the guards uh, says he wants to eat <laughs> raisins. <laughs> this uh, All right. This comes out of nowhere. Okay. It's just the guards. It just says, uh, like in the book, it just says like, and the guards begin to have this conversation. And then one of the guards is like, I really want to eat raisins. Do you think he actually said, uh, I want to eat dates? And by that, I meant I want to go on a date. I don't I don't think that's no, I don't think so either. But that would be kind of funny if they mistranslated it. I will ra- want to go on a date. He wants to eat raisins. <laughs> raisins are a, like a big metaphor in this book. I don't know why. Really? Yes. It, co- it comes up a few times. It's um, it's because it's from what I gathered. The life that's gotten old and dried out, but still sweet. No, from what I've gathered is that raisins are a luxury food. Oh, sure. Okay. So raisins are used to represent, I want a better life okay. than what I have. Okay. I could, yeah, that's fine. But when I'll I, allow it. when I was reading this at first, it just, some dude, some guard is like, I, I want really, raisins. I really want raisins, man. I could go for right now some sun made. Yeah, but I, you know, I just don't have any and I really want yeah. some. And all the other guards are like, yeah, bro word yeah and i was like what is this book <laughs> um, but no this this book is 50 percent metaphor right 40 percent of like philosophizing about islamic theologies and okay. just ra- just random shit and then it's seven percent rape and then three percent actual storytelling i don't like that seven percent no i'm sorry it's it's gonna happen yeah so yeah, one of the guards is talking about he wants to eat raisins, and uh, and the other guards kind of turn this innocuous comment, seemingly innocuous comment. Yeah, I now understand the metaphor. When I wrote right, these notes, right. I didn't, but they turn it into like a philosophical debate. Okay, about the merits of being rich and living in luxury and different all this stations. Shit. That kind of yeah, thing. that every conversation turns into a philosophical debate in this book. Hey, you know who debates on whether being rich is a good thing or not? Who? People who aren't rich. It's true. Because rich people love it. Yeah. What do you think about being rich? Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I think it's a thing. I think you're right. <laughs> uh, Zabiba arrives at the palace. Okay. Uh, yep. And the guards almost shoot her. Um, That's with, the opposite. With the, the bows and arrows. Well, they don't know who she is. So he's like, hey, if this girl shows up, let her in. And they're like, well, he wasn't very specific. He just said this girl. Yeah, he was like, like a, a woman named Zabiba will be my guest and she will arrive. And they're expecting a carriage with an armed escort because those are the only types of people that come to the palace. I see. So she just rocking up on her own. Yeah. Oh, it's just some common woman just walking through the gates and they're like, gotcha. ready to kill her. It's like anti Aladdin. Yeah. So. um, So, yeah, she just comes rocking up to the gate. Uh, pretty ballsy. And she introduces herself, and they're like, oh, you're the guest. We didn't expect you to just be a person, a commoner, walking alone. <laughs> Which I can understand. And then she she explains to them that her name means raisin. Hey, I'm Zabiba. My name means raisin. And you're not going to make friends that way, honestly. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, I'm Zabiba. My name means everything that you want for and, and hope for in life. Uh, and she explains that she was named that because her mother uh, really wanted to eat raisins, but she couldn't have any raisins. Her mother really wanted a better life, but she couldn't have a better life. I Essentially. Get but, I get it. Uh, and then she says something about she couldn't have any raisins, so she named me Raisin so that she could have at least one. So while she's talking to the guards, the captain of the guard comes up. Yes. And they explain, oh, this is Zabiba, the, the you know, king's guest. And the captain of the guard is of the same mind of she can't be 
because she's alone. Right. She doesn't have any horses no with her or anything. Yeah. Um, and so it takes some convincing from Zabiba that she is, in fact, the king's guest, right? And that's not something you could just go like, hey, that girl that you said, uh, we think she's here. We're not sure. Do you want to check her out? It, well, the, he, yeah, he does that. He, I think he, he, he leaves and Zabiba thinks that he goes to talk to the king mm. and then come back for like confirmation or whatever. Gotcha. Once before the king, Zabiba bows to him and he gives her a hug, calling her dear. Oh. Uh, which is significant to her. She's like, oh my yeah. God, he's calling me dear. Oh, calling me dear, he's the king? Yeah. Uh, the king uh, tells her that the merchant who owned the land that she lived on uh, was banished for selling fake honey. Ooh, you don't do that. I don't know how you how, sell fake honey. How do you f- fake? I don't know. I don't know if there's a translation thing, but it literally says he was selling the best honey in the land, and then it turned out he was a fraud. Maybe it just wasn't the best honey? Is that like when you go to a coffee shop that says like best coffee the world's in the best world? cup of coffee? Yeah, and then they're just not. So the you next one them. right next door says world's best cup of coffee. Yeah, like I want to see one that says world's second best cup because at least they're honest. <laughs> uh, so he, he gets banished for selling fake honey. All right, and his land is taken by the is the state. Oh, of right? course, yeah. Oh, that. Hmm. 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 <laughs> no, that's a good thing. Give the guy the authority to banish someone and then seize his property. It's a good thing, though, because all the workers get to stay there and live and work for the state. <laughs> Instead of for the merchant. Right. Is the state um, better than the merchant? In this book, in yes. In this book, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they talk at length about politics. Um, it, there's so much politics between Zabiba and the king. Mm-hmm. It is nauseating the amount of talk about politics. Uh, and Zabiba tells the king that he must play a bigger role in social reform. She's like, look, uh, the people don't really know you and you don't know the people. People want raisins, man. Right. You need to you need to not bring yourself lower, but you need to understand your people. Bring them up. Yeah, exactly. That's that's that. she's all about social reform, right? Interesting. That's her uh, that's her 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 flag is social reform. OK. Uh, the king tells her that he is too busy. Well, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's not too busy to see a married woman like every day. No, <laughs> no, just too busy to actually reform and maybe better your people and you yep. know, do good things for them. But he's a good, wise king. Well, is he? <laughs> no, he's not. This old woman seems to think so. <laughs> the narrator, the uh, the narrator's narrator. He's an unreliable narrator. I'm telling you right now. Oh, yeah. Well, and unreliable author. Yes. <laughs> just everything about this is unreliable. <laughs> Uh, Zabiba suggests that he creates a people's council to make oh. to make decisions regarding social reform. OK, OK. Hey, you suck at this. Maybe you should appoint some people to do it. Right. And they end their discussion and they begin uh, walking around the corridors. Huh. Which isn't they didn't really end their discussion. They just moved it to walking around the corridors. I showed you my corridor. Please respond. <laughs> No, it's it's very much understood in this book that he can do whatever he wants to her or with her. He just has to say so. But right. because he's a good, wise king, he doesn't. He doesn't make her do anything. Well, you know, the, the mark of a good man is somebody who uh, doesn't intentionally force himself upon someone, even though he could. Right. Even though in the book, he fucking reminds her of that every now and then. What? Like, you know, I'm the king. and I can do whatever the fuck I want. Good, wise king. All right. So they're walking around the corridors. And then Zabiba makes a comment about how the place is really dark and dingy and just like a shitty palace. Okay. (laughs) Uh, And she tells the king that he needs to uh, get out of the house more often. I feel so called out. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because to her, he's obviously depressed and lonely. Right. Um, Because he just sits in his palace all day. Well, he is depressed and and lonely. Yeah, he's sick of it. So she's like, you need to go. You need to get out. You need to be in the sunshine. Get a social club. Right. (laughs) Go golfing. Come on. Yeah. Go throw vegetables at people in the stocks. <laughs> I don't know why that's where I went with that. I don't know either, but that's a great pastime, I yeah, would think. Yeah. Zabiba and the king make plans for the following Saturday. Nice. Um, and it's <laughs> they do a whole thing where he's like, uh, so you like coming back Friday? And she's like, ah, Friday's not good for me. I have a Saturday. So I got like a, a, a thing on Friday. I got a, I got a thing. It's yeah. girls night. It's <laughs> girls night. I think it's literally the, the, the day of worship. Friday? It's Friday. Or Saturday. Oh, yeah. And she's a devout uh, Muslim. Oh. So she says, I can't do that. And he, he was testing he, her. He respects her. Uh, and he's like, the king isn't Muslim, by the way. Oh. He uh, worships. I, I don't remember what it was. It was basically the old gods. Huh. 
right? It's just like these old pagan idols or whatever is what he does. Interesting. Yep. Is that a thing about Saddam Hussein? No, I don't think so. Was I mean, he was Muslim, right? Maybe yeah, he wasn't. I'm pretty, he was. I think so. I, I was going to do a shit ton of research for this, but after reading the book, I was like, fuck this book. I'm going to do the minimal amount. <laughs> maybe so maybe he not, was repressed. Maybe he was Muslim, but he didn't want to be. Maybe. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but um, that, that's the way the king is. Interesting. As a parting gift, uh, the king gives her a horse and uh, a bag of gold. Ooh. Yep. And she has this whole thing in her brain where she's like, you know, that's generous of the king. And then she thinks and she's like, well, that's not really generosity because he's not sacrificing anything meaningful. Right. That's true. Arabian horses were very, very well. I, I'm going to say I think that's still. Yeah. It's generous as long as there's no ulterior motive. Right. It's generous as long as this is a, hey, this is a parting gift. Right. But I mean, obviously he has ulterior. Well, motive, of course so he does. Like, fuck him. That's the boner. Yeah. So, um. And she was walking from her home to the palace, but now the king is like, well, right here, have a horse, have a horse. Next so time you, you come back. Yeah. And then she was like, I don't know how I'm going to take care of it. And then he's like, we'll have a bag of gold too. And I don't have uh, a way to care for this horse. Now you do. And she's like, oh, I'm pretty sure horses don't eat gold. And he's like, Oh, <laughs> if I was him, I would respond with, okay, dumbass." <laughs> when she returns to the palace for the next meeting, the following Saturday, yeah. uh, she sees many women in lavish dresses, d- dresses. Women in lavish dresses. But the women in lavish dresses in the courtyard. Huge. And among them is the queen. The queen. The queen. Wow. Uh, The queen approaches Zabiba and is uh, rather rude to her. I can get, yeah, that makes sense. She's very belittling, saying, uh, look what the cat dragged in. Because you know Saddam, I mean, the king didn't shut up about her. Uh, Probably not. Yeah. He's like, hey, wife, check out my new girlfriend, <laughs> <laughs> which is horrible. Um, so, hey, powerless wife, check out my powerless new girlfriend, because I said so. So the queen is just being really harsh on her. Yeah. Understandably. The queen believes that Zabiba is trying to steal the king from her. Yes. I don't know why, but, you know. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so the queen tell you know, the queen, is like, they're going back and forth. They're having a bit of a, a heated Ooh. Uh, discussion here. And the queen says that uh, the king should make her a priority, the queen. Okay. Over, we, over some common woman. Do we get the queen's name? Is it metaphorical at all? She does not have a name. Most of the characters in the book do not have a name. I think there's like four named characters. That makes sense. Yeah. So she's like, you know, the, the king should make me a priority, not some common woman. Right. Again. Again, right. I, I, yeah. I get behind that. <laughs> I mean, not queen aside, wife. Right, exactly. Wife should take priority. Por que no las dos? Zabiba kind of shoots back uh, and says, maybe the king got bored of you. Ooh, maybe if you gave him that more than on his birthday, he'd be fine. And, <laughs> Which, that's a horrible sentiment. It's a horrible thing to say. And I, I Bored of you? But I did put in parentheses, puts on sunglasses. <laughs> Deal with it. Yeah. Wow. Like, maybe the king got bored of you. It's very men writing women. Yes, and... Her saying this kind of elevates this discussion. Yes. Into a, almost a screaming match. Because she's the damn queen. Right. You don't talk that way to the fucking queen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very surprised she wasn't just fucking executed. Same. It would make the book shorter. Yeah. Uh, mercifully so. As their <laughs> conversation becomes more heated, Zabiba explains to the queen that uh, she doesn't know the king like Zabiba does. Which is, again, very ballsy thing to say to the queen. Ballsy, blatant, and... Probably, probably wrong. Yeah, probably not true. How long has she been queen and Zabiba's met him, what, thrice? Yeah, like the queen has been married to the king for years. Yeah. Let me tell you, if you're married to somebody for years, even if you're just in the same building as them for years, you know them. Right. And she says that while the queen is in his bed, Zabiba is in his heart. That's a good line. At the end of their encounter, uh, Zabiba begins laughing at the queen. Because at this point, the queen is hysterical and just screaming at her. And Zabiba's laughing because she's lost her composure. She yeah, doesn't seem she, very... She won. She, she didn't win. She's just a she's she's just a horrible woman. <laughs> yes, she's a home wrecker. Well, no, she won in her mind. I mean, yes, uh, and it, <laughs> so this this is literally what the book says. Zabiba begins laughing at the queen. Okay, and all of the servants and concubines surrounding the courtyard join in laughter. Wow, mocking the king. This is literally one of those. And then everyone clapped. <laughs> stories. <laughs> it is. It is. Oh, my gosh. This completely plays out as some fantasy of her owning the queen. The queen has nothing to respond with, and everybody supports her. So she said this, and I said, deal with it. Yeah. You don't love your husband. And then everyone looked at me, laughed, and I was 
given five dollars. Yeah, and everybody was like, "You go, girl." Uh, it, that's exactly what this is. It just it made me fucking sick. Wow. Um. So Zabiba, after this, just goes to the king's chambers. Uh, and at this point, they are me on my way to fuck your king. <laughs> Uh, at this point, they're like openly professing their love for each other. Oh, well, this moved fast. She she did completely wreck his her her only competition in a rap battle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I I really want to see that played out as a rap battle. That'd I, be awesome. It would be entertaining. So the king uh starts telling her about his upbringing. Oh, uh, his parents were cousins. Everyone's a fucking married to their cousin. It's true, but also right now we have a story being narrated by a guy who was a kid when he heard the story from a woman who was a kid when she realized the story, Mm -hmm. who was talking about a man who is now a kid. It's Inception, bro. It goes deep. (laughs) Uh, I think the the editor even makes a note like that. Oh, really? (laughs) It's it's unbelievable how deep these stories go. It just keeps, keeps going. So his parents were cousins. Uh, after he was born, his mother was no longer able to conceive. Oh. And because of this, his father became very anxious about his line, right? I mean, yeah, that kind of makes sense. The, the, the old king was very faithful to his queen and had no concubines. But since she couldn't conceive anymore, they, decide, they decided jointly that he should have concubines. Okay. Because she wants to be supportive. Right. She wants to support him. She can't fulfill, at this time, her one role. Her quote-unquote duty. Right. Uh, and so she d- she picks a wife for him because okay. she's like, I want to support you. I'm going to pick the wife. And she picks like some ugly woman. Honestly, if I were the wife looking for a new girl for my husband, I would do the same thing. Right. Because you best believe I'm the best damn thing in your world. <laughs> so she's she's not that good looking. She's not very well educated or anything like that. Sure. And then so he starts having kids by her. This is the perfect genes to run a kingdom. Right. And so and so they're like, okay, this is a good situation. We got a, a baby making wife here, which yeah. is which is making babies. You got your baby making wife making babies and your actual wife making actual wife. Yeah, exactly. So they're they're kind of happy here. But the king kind of likes having another wife. And uh he's there's getting some more concubines okay. with, without consulting his wife. Uh-huh. Uh there's trouble in paradise. Yeah. Paradise. <laughs> the closest thing approximating paradise, okay. I guess. But he still holds her as, like, the light of his life. Look, you're the one. I'm just going to be in this room for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and all of these other concubines become very bitter and jealous towards the queen. Right. Because they're like... like She's still the one. Like, yeah, like, why? She can't give him any more children. Why, right. why does she... Why does he care about her anymore? He should be focusing on us. Right. Uh, which, just polygamy is just a bad idea. Yeah, for it's sure. always, we're not built for that. No. <laughs> like, it's not a good idea. I don't know that it has ever worked successfully. Uh, and so the king's father sends the king, who is like a young prince now, he's a kid. Okay. He yep. sends him away to live with one of the father's cousins outside of the palace, because he's afraid. They're going to take it out on the only heir that right. is from the actual woman that I love. Uh, in, in somewhere in this time, the queen mother is uh, poisoned to death. Oh, and uh, and there's there's some turmoil going down in the palace for right sure. Now, okay, but he's now living outside the palace, and he grows up. But he's still treated like royalty, just very quietly. Right. But once his father dies, he returns to claim his place as king. Right. It's me. I promise. Zabiba asks the king why, if having so many wives was a downfall for his father, would he also choose to have many wives? Valid question. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. It was like, bro, <laughs> you didn't learn anything from your dad. No. Uh, the king replies, I don't have that many. <laughs> Bruh, do you see the issue? The answer is yeah. no, he doesn't. I see parallels with King Solomon. King Solomon, and also in that story, there was a lot of hints of Abraham and uh, like Isaac and Ishmael. Oh, yeah, definitely. Zabiba tells him that uh, by the people's measure, it is too many wives. Uh, and the king tells her that royalty measures things differently. <laughs> My royal dick is 10 feet long. Mm-hmm. We measure things differently. It, these are royal feet. They're bigger. <laughs> uh, Zabiba tells him that if he integrates more with the common people, that they will love him and he won't have to fear betrayal and conspiracy anymore. Same thing that we had before. Yes. But the betrayal and conspiracy didn't come from the people. It came from right. the concubines. Right. That, that's my problem with it is that would not fix the situation at all. Right. <laughs> Unless she means the concubines are people, which, I mean, they are, but the people, I should say. Right. Well, but the concubines aren't even, they're not uh, considered common people because they're in the palace. Right. They're above right. common people. So like the common people is not his problem. Right. And having, being friendly with common people would not fix his problem. Right. So shut, shut the fuck up, Zabiba. <laughs> uh, 
As time passes, the king badgers her more about leaving her husband and marrying him. Naturally. Zabiba replies, he is my husband by your own law, and I must remain faithful to him. Which, good point. I mean, yeah. She's like, it's because of the law you lay down that I cannot leave him for you. One of two things is going to happen here. What do you think is going to happen? I think it is going to either, he is either going to change the law. Right. Which I don't think he will. Right. I think he is going to disappear to her husband. Uh, th- that's what I thought too. Okay. So, so let's read ahead. See if our predictions are correct. Yes. But they're both determined to love each other despite this obstacle. But you literally have all of the problems with him. Uh, and I got to say, it's not an obstacle. It's a fucking wall. Yeah. That's not an obstacle. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot love each other. If, hey, you're... if you're looking for a relationship and everything in the world is standing between you. Yeah. Probably not a big, you know, not a good idea. No. Um, the king begins to notice uh, over time a change in Zabiba's mood. Ooh. He asks her what is bothering her, but she kind of dances around the subject and doesn't seem to want to talk about it. Okay. The king guesses that has something to do with her husband. Eventually, she tells him that uh, she was forced to marry her husband. It was kind of a debtor situation. Her father owed the guy oh, money. Sure. Yeah. And uh, children and, are collateral. And he was her fucking cousin again. Why does every marriage have to be between cousins in this book? I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Saddam Hussein had a cousin fixation. I think he did. It even mentions in the book that that is not normal. But by every account in this book, it is very normal. <laughs> it's normal in the book, but the book is not normal. I guess. It's like, this is very weird, but everybody's doing it. So, okay. It's just how it is. So she was forced to marry her husband because of the debt situation. Uh, and her husband didn't really, he, he just lusted after her. Um, he, he didn't see her as a person. He doesn't love her. Right. He didn't love her. He didn't treat her as a person at all. And he forced her to be intimate without her consent. Right. Which again, makes sense for the time. Now, now this is rape, but the book does not posture it as rape. Right. Because she being a very faithful Islamic wife would submit to her husband, even though she didn't want to. Right. She had to, otherwise she would potentially be killed. So while this is rape. The book does not classify. It makes a distinction between rape and what she is doing. Right. Which I don't agree with. No, not at all. But that is her situation. Mm -hmm. She's with a husband who doesn't love her, doesn't care about her, doesn't give a shit about her, even beats her. But she was like, I have to be a faithful wife because that is what my religion demands. Right. Uh, The king is not exactly empathetic about her situation. Why don't you just join my religion? And uh, and they kind of get into an argument because she bears her heart to him. Yeah. And she's like, I'm in this horrible situation. And he's like, "Okay, what does that have to do with me? Right? Good, wise king. I, 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 GWK. So they get into a fight. Yeah. Understandably, because he's an asshole. Well, yeah, for sure. She's in a horrible situation, and he is completely unempathetic. Yep. But during this argument, they really strive to understand one another. So it's, I don't know, I don't know what kind of person he is, because sometimes he is just completely tone deaf. He's whatever he needs to be. Right. And then at, at certain points, he actually seems like he tries to understand her. And tries to learn from her as much as he can. Hmm. So I don't know what the fuck he is, but I, I guess he's just completely ignorant, I guess. Like he is so, he's been a king his whole life. He knows nothing about the plights of a common person. Right. So I guess that's what they're going for. I didn't get that feeling, but I get the feeling that's what they're going for. Right. Mm-hmm. He's just completely ignorant and just not empathetic because he's been a rich He can't asshole. fathom it. Right. So in the middle of this whole thing, uh, Zabiba sees an assassin with a sword step out from behind a curtain behind the king's back. Um, timing. This is this was very reminiscent of Indiana Jones and the uh, the Temple of Doom. Indy's in his room, and then there's a mural on the wall. But then oh, yeah. one of the painted yeah, yeah. men is actually just a man standing there with a yeah, sword. I forgot about that. that yeah, long. that's the movie I've seen the least of the four. Me too. But it's a great scene. I love that scene. So she sees an assassin behind his back, uh, and then Zabiba screams and then shields him with her body. So she steps in front oh, of the king. Get down, Mr. President. And the assassin cuts her down the chest. Oh. And she falls to the floor. It then says the king kills the assassin with one strike to the head. It doesn't say he has a weapon. So I'm assuming he just punches him once and the dude is dead. I'm picturing the full, he has the fist, his arm is fully extended, and he swings it back around his back and just bops him on the top of the head. <laughs> like, doink. <laughs> So he kills the assassin with one blow to the head. One punch! After this, uh, the king swears to himself that he will leave the palace and live as a commoner. Eventually. Why? I, I don't know. He, like, he, well, the he, people are trying to kill me now. 
Well, he thinks that, well, no, he thinks that, uh, she's dying. So I guess he's like, as a promise to you, my oh, love. Oh, right. That's right. She got, I completely I will, forgot I will, that she got cut. Right. I will do what, what you want me to do and integrate myself with the people right. and give up this life of as luxury. As you're dying, as your dying wish, I will yada yada. Right. Which he 180s on the second he knows she's not going to die, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Spoiler alert, she's, she's not going to die. Yeah. Uh, so Zabiva is cared for by the royal doctors and recovers in the palace. She's like put in a room right next to his bed chambers. Of course. Um, which like apparently not even the fucking queen is that close to the king. <laughs> what? So she like, probably has her own wing. Yeah. I mean, it's probably the fucking queen that had that assassin after him, right? I would not be surprised. Uh, so he visits her as often as he can. See yeah. if she's doing and she's recovering and stuff and they are talking as much as they can because he they, they both see this opportun- opportunity to spend time with each other. Yeah. And uh, I guess he just sends word to the husband like, yo, your wife got almost killed and I'm going to keep her here. So, I mean, what could the husband do? Right. Thro- yeah. Throughout this book, it's just like nobody can defy the king. Yeah. So I, I can only imagine people being in these situations like I, it must be fucking awful to have like someone just completely all powerful, just take something from you yes. and be like, it, it, whatever, deal with it. At least he, this is not a mark for the husband, but at least he didn't love her. Right. I mean, it's, it's fortunate for her. Right. 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 It is a hundred percent beneficial and it is the, clearly the good thing to do. Right. In this opinion. Zabiba tells the king that he needs to investigate what happened. Mm-hmm. Like you need to th- th- find th- out who did that. Right. Who sent this assassin, right? Uh, the king says, why? The assassin is dead. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> Mr. King, Mr. King, you do realize that if there's an assassin, that means somebody sent them to you. <laughs> and if the assassin is dead, the person who sent them probably isn't. I mean, I'm, no, I'm sure he was acting on his own. He just got into the palace somehow by himself. Right, right. With a sword. <laughs> with a sword. And uh, just clearly had access to, were they in his private chambers at that point? Yes. Just had access to the private chambers. Right. And uh, just only wanted to kill you a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> Zabiba tells him that he was but one arrow and the king needs to find the bow and quiver. That's a metaphor I've heard before, but that's fine. The king says, but the assassin was using a sword, not a bow. <laughs> Does Zabiba rethink her life? Because at this point... I know, at this point, I'm like, this king is literally have, a dumbass. Have you ever, have you ever met somebody that um, you spent a lot of like, time and proximity around um, for one reason or another, and you like if you make a joke or something like that, that you have to explain it to them every single time. Yeah, they just don't understand anything that you're saying because yeah. that is the most infuriating thing. I, I've known people like that, and I try not to be around them. Exactly, cause... perfectly harmless, wonderful people. Don't talk to me. No, what I love, which is a quality that me and my older brother share, mm-hmm. which is we our our sarcasm can get cranked up to a point where we pretend to be stupid so that like we pretend not to understand a joke to be funny right i don't get it so fuck you so, <laughs> but the problem that both of us have run into is yeah. that if you do that some people will just They'll think, think you're it's not satire. stupid yes yes for sure and that is very very frustrating <laughs> that is like no 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 i understand what you, you know i've gotten i've gotten that too and i've gotten in most cases i'm just like you know what Never mind. No, it's okay. I get the joke. I'm just taking it to the next level meta, but you didn't follow me there. That's okay. Yeah, That's fine. I'll just lower myself to your level so that doesn't happen again. <laughs> get wrecked, nerd. Uh, Zabiba explains that she was speaking metaphorically <laughs> and that there's a larger conspiracy at play. Dumbass. To have to explain this to a fucking king. I'm going to call him Alexander because he's a dumbass. Yeah, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> Alexander Dumas wrote The Three Musketeers. and, and Now that is an advanced joke that I did not get. No one did, and I'm trying to make it popular. <laughs> okay. Because that is one of my, I, it's an original, <laughs> and I'm trying <laughs> You've been workshopping this there. in clubs around the country, yes. and it's just not coming together like you want? Well, no. <laughs> because nobody knows who Alexander Dumas is. Uh, I, every time I hear the name, I think it's a fucking like real, like a person who's like a, a conquerer in real life, not an author. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, it them, sounds yeah. like a conqueror's name. Alexander Dumas. Yeah. Uh, so Zabiba, again, impresses on the king the need to become more familiar with the common people and to integrate with the lower dregs of society. Hey, the thing you just promised me, do it. She, she is on this train, man. Seems like it. This Which, is... I mean, it's a good... It's a, it's a decent train. 
I mean, look, she is the really hot hippie babe who's into crystal power, and he's the dude who placates her so he could get laid. Right. And she is like, yo, you really have to meditate with crystals or else I might not want to talk to you anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I'll get right and on And he's that. like, okay, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, it's... Crystal, sure. I, I don't know how to do that, but we'll do that sometime, you know? Like, yeah, we'll try it. And then she, she gets on him about his astrology sign, and he's like, I mean, I know that I'm a cancer and you're a Taurus and that's not compatible. I don't know if that's not compatible or not, but anyways, moving on. <laughs> my, uh, my grandmother was killed by a giant crab. <laughs> I'm a Gemini, by the way. Aquarius. Cool. That means nothing to either of us. <laughs> <laughs> so one day the king is sitting next to Zabiba's bed and servants bring them tea. Nice. What's uh, the tea? I, I knew you were going to ask that. Yeah. I didn't write it down. I was looking for it. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a very common tea. When I read the name, I was like, oh, it's that tea. But now I can't even remember what it is. It had like three syllables. Chamomile. Yes, that's it. Which is not three. That's hey. four, right? It depends no, on three. if you say my yol or mile. Yes, th- it's three. So it was, it's chamomile tea. You got it. Nice. Um, I know my tea. <laughs> so Earl Grey. Hot. Uh, so You had Lady Grey tea? No. Lady Grey tea is pretty good. I'm not really into tea in general. I like iced tea, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, especially Southern iced tea, which is just straight sugar Powder water. sugar per five gallons of water. <laughs> uh, but I, my mom was way into tea. Yeah. Uh, and so I tried tea and it just, it, t- it tastes like fucking leaves. I don't like leaves. <laughs> you got to get the right flavor of leaves. I guess. I, I would love to try to get into tea because that could be a fun thing. I've got, I've got a couple teas that I can, I can let you try. They're, they're, they're pretty good. I got like a raspberry yeah. tea. Oh, that it's it smells amazing and it, it tastes like like raspberries. It's really yeah. good. And then there's a, I don't have it yet, but I'm going to reorder it. But there's a, like an orange spice tea that just smells like uh-huh. um, it's it's citrus and it's um, fuck. What's the what's the spice you put on like a pumpkin pie? Um, nutmeg. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There is nutmeg in it as well. It just it tastes amazing. You got to put a little bit, little bit of sugar in there just to kind of get that part of the palate going. Yeah. But not too much and no cream, no milk. Hmm. Just regular tea and a little little bit of sugar. Where the fuck were we? They were bringing their tea. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what was the name you used in the beginning? Who were you and who am I? <laughs> well, I'm the six-year-old kid with tetanus and you're an antivaxxer. I'm an antivaxxer. That's right. That's right. So uh, they, they, they bring him tea and Zabiba stops him from drinking it. And uh, she's like, this may be poisoned, you know? It's true. I'm surprised he didn't have a taster. That was a thing before then. Well, oh, the way she says it is, this may be a new poisoned arrow. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Getting back to the metaphor. Right. (laughs) Does he say no, but it's tea? (laughs) Tell me he doesn't say no, it's tea. He informs her that it is in fact tea. Oh my God. (laughs) What? Why? That's not an arrow. That's fucking tea. King, we've been over this. You remember that metaphor I used? What's a a metaphor? You're a metaphor. He's a goddamn child. Uh, Zabita explains that she is speaking figuratively well, again. And this is, this is from the interpretation of like three different children being told a story. Oh yeah. So this he is... probably is a child and it probably wasn't the king who said that. It was probably the first kid. Someone who fucked up the story. Yeah. He's They're... like, wait, what's a sword? <laughs> um, so it says in the book that they test it and it is indeed poisoned. That does not explain how they test it. A pigeon. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming they give it to an animal and the animal dies. Yeah. But I don't know. The king thanks her. And she says, don't thank me, thank Allah. And so he does. He thanks Allah. Oh, thanks, Allah. Uh, and this makes Zabita very happy. Okay. She's like, yes, <laughs> the conversion is going well. Once she has recovered fully from the sword wound. Yes. She continued to ride to and from the palace. Oh. But this time, she, like, she starts wearing beautiful clothes that the king has bought for her. Oh, okay. Which yeah. is not what you want to do. We go back to your abusive husband is wear fancy new <laughs> dresses that the king bought you. Hey, honey, I'm going out. Where'd you get that dress? Oh, I'm, the guy I'm going to see gave it to me. <laughs> the, not just the guy she's seeing, the king. The all-powerful king who I have to obey whenever he tells me to do anything gave it to me. Well, now you're making it sound understandable. <laughs> the way I was going was that the husband is like, not only is she cheating on me possibly with a guy, it's a guy who's way better than me. I, I, I guess I, so I'm of the opinion here where the husband realizes that she has no choice. Is that not the case? No, I think that's very much the case. You're right. That's not the way I was thinking about this, right. but that is absolutely the case where the, under, the husband completely understands that like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Things, and it's not like I love her. So whatever. Right. That he thinks it'd be like it does and it, and it is. But uh, I'm, I'm speaking from a point of view of someone who's in love with her, right? Right. Um, like, we, I mean, we know he's not. Right. But 
I'm just, I'm just assuming a husband would love her. And if someone you love is going to meet someone else who's well, just that's because you're a good person. Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but that, that's just <laughs> that was like such a wholesome, genuine, genuine moment there. I meant that. As time goes on, uh, she feels more dead inside for having to live with a husband she hates. It's and, a skillet song. And him, <laughs> and him, like, forcing himself on her every right, time. Right, you know? right. She's, she's just... Well, yeah, she found an escape now. Right, but she can't have it. Right. So it's tearing her apart, right? Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew it was going in that direction. <laughs> One time, while with the king, uh, he asks about Allah, and oh. Z- Zabiba essentially proselytizes to him. Sure. That's what you do in that situation. And, uh, and they talk for hours about the nature of Allah and, and also just the nature of like ruling. That, that is a huge theme of this book is like, hmm. what is the nature of ruling a country and being a person in power? Because, you know, what does that mean? What can you do with it? Saddam was saying, um, I mean, you should you should rule for your people's interest and fuck the rich people, which I don't think is what Saddam ended up doing. <laughs> I think he did the second just literally. And they, they also talk about like what the common people want from a king. Because yeah. the king doesn't know. Because he has no concept um, of it. At, at this point in the book, like I, I'm, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to put the book down. This, sure. is about, this is about halfway through. And it's so fucking boring. Yeah. This is one of the most boring books I've slogged through. You've slogged through some boring ones. Right. And I knew, I knew there were nuggets in here. So I, right. I pushed through it. So I'm like, I know there's going to be some crazy shit coming out of left field at any second, which does later. Nice. <laughs> but, but for the most part, this is one of the most fucking boring books ever. The king asks Sabiba how she became so enlightened and knowledgeable. Because whenever they talk about something, she seems to know what's up. Hey, right? you're a woman. How do you know this? Exactly. I mean, it makes total sense. Like, women were not educated. So... What's up? Yeah. Uh, she begins talking about her life before meeting him. Her husband never treated her like a person, only as a means of sexual gratification. We know this. Her father felt uncomfortable with the whole situation and slept outside. <laughs> so. Right, because they would they, they have family homes. <laughs> yes. You stay in the same house when you're married. That's amazing. So he's like, I'm just going to live outside. <laughs> so he only comes into the house when absolutely necessary. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. He's, that, a, he's a great dad. Just leave. I mean, or don't put your daughter in that situation. <laughs> or just, but I don't know, just fucking. Do anything do, else? Yeah, don't just shove your head in the sand and pretend it's not happening. God. This, this gets really sad. Um, oh, boy. She was once pregnant, but her husband beat her so badly that she miscarried. Oh. And since then, she has not conceived yeah. again. And it makes, it does this whole thing about how if a woman does not, love the man she has sex with then she won't conceive but she already did once and that's not true anyway yeah that's not how that works that's not that's, so this whole this little portion of the book was so fucking terrible just it's again men writing women yeah it's like a dude who doesn't know anything about women doesn't give a shit about women yeah. writing women it's like awful uh, um blah. so zabiba talks at length about the merchant his skill who owned the property right uh, and how horrible he was. And I'm not going to go into details because it's it's actually a little unnecessarily grisly. Right, uh, right. He's just, think of the most horrible person you can. That's him. Saddam Hussein? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Saddam Hussein uh, uh, in actuality. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was really confused because I was looking up information about the book after I finished reading right. it. And there was one guy who was talking about the merchant, his skill being her husband. But that's not true. So, like, I I read the fucking book. And it it makes it treats them as two separate persons. Oh, but then I read this guy's like st- review of the book, and he was like, "And the merchant, his skill, her husband." And I was like, "But no, the book literally says that the the merchant was banished, and he's no longer on the property. But the husband is still on the property because he just okay." Because I was kind of okay. This is a point of con- clarification then, because okay. I was under the impression that the merchant was her husband. Oh no! But you're totally right. You did say that he was banished, and then she's still going home to her husband. Yes. They're separate maybe it's people. because maybe it's because we see her on his property and he's the only named person. Maybe that's why that association maybe. exists. Maybe, but yeah, I, I read this this person talking about. It. I'm like, bro, am I wrong or are you wrong? And then I double checked. I'm like, no, you're wrong, bro. <laughs> it's not the same person. Interesting. Yeah. So and and her husband was like rubbing shoulders with the merchant because he he wanted to be like the merchant. Okay. Okay. Right. Which is you know you can live on my property if you uh, do everything I tell you to. Kind of. The merchant was kind of showing him the ropes or something. Because sure. he was like, I want you to be like me. The guy's like, I want to be like you. Ooby-doo. It's a, yeah, <laughs> it's a mutual understanding here. 
So it's basically the short version of this discussion she has with him is that Zabiba knows stuff because she spent a lot of time around the merchant and his guests. I see. Right. She learned through osmosis. Yeah. And not willingly. She didn't want to be around the guy. Right. But she was forced to be there and yep. she just heard things and you might as well. So over time, their love for each other grows stronger. This is Zabiba and the king. Yes. Okay. Zabiba asks the king for a favor, a legal divorce from her husband, which I didn't even know you could fucking do. Why didn't they just do that like yeah. right away? <laughs> Maybe lead with that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't say that he changes the law. It says that he allows a legal divorce. So he just nullifies the marriage. Right. And uh, again, yeah, it's like, why not just start with that? What? The, why are we just now getting to that? That wasn't one of my two predictions. Uh, no, I totally didn't see that coming either because they treat it like it's not an option. Yeah. They don't even talk about it. But, um, I, hmm. So he agrees. In your history, did you come up, maybe I'll touch on this later, did you come up with any research as to whether or not that is a thing? Like, was it precedented? From, I didn't look into this, but from what I remember, uh, just from learning about shit in the yeah. past, is that, that that is a common thing with kings, is that a lot of pl- a lot of countries, a lot of ancient places, you could not get a divorce unless the king said you could. That makes sense. Right. So that that's not an uncommon practice, I'm right. pretty sure. Right. If you know better, uh, then write into the show, a page too far at gmail.com. Let us know. Do it. So he, uh, he agrees, obviously. And then after this, it kind of like goes through a little montage of the king doing things. Uh, he burns his idols. Nice. He converts to Islam. Okay. Uh, mission accomplished. Yep. And he proposes to Zabita. Oh. And he says, we know where this is going. Yeah. You just say yes. What do you think she says? No. She does say no. She's like, I'm free now. Well, no, not for that reason. She, she says she would never consider marrying him unless they were truly equals. That is the shittiest thing. Well, she's like, I, I'm, I'm just kind of trapped where I am now. And if I were to marry you, I would still be trapped because I'd just be your queen. I'd be subservient to you. But, and I'm not defending this. Right. That's the whole point. <laughs> right. <laughs> is, that mean, not, am, is that not the king's purpose. I mean, to me, I was thinking that's a hell of a better situation than what you're in now. So for sure, not not good. But right, we're looking at this as there is no good way out. Right. But uh, no, she's she's like, I am not about that life. I want you to be like the common people, and I don't want you to be in a. This it's not ever going to fucking happen, lady. I mean, <laughs> like he's he's never going to give up his royalty. I, was, I would say she's not doing it for the money, then. But he's still going to be the king. Yeah, whatever like, happens, he's still the king, unless he stops being the king. In which case. I'm pretty sure he's still the king. Yeah, I don't I don't get her logic or what she's going for, but that's that's not going to happen. But but equal she's... treatment. Tweetment? <laughs> <laughs> equal treatment, sure, but that's uh that's when two birds in the same cage get the same amount of food. Yeah. Equal yeah. treatment. Um so he's uh that's kind of a downer for him, right? Yeah. Hey, I I freed you. Yeah. So Well, did you? Where's uh, she staying? She, she's still living with her her husband. Aren't they divorced? Not yet. She, she's just saying that he will get them oh, divorced. Oh, oh, I'll, div- I'll, I'll, I will, I will legalize your divorce. Please marry me. Yeah. It was just, yeah. Like a twofer. Okay. So by this point, everybody knows about Zabiba and the king. Yeah. They are not keeping it a secret. Right. No, they're not even trying to keep Every it a secret. Every time those double doors open, they're like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> they're perfect. Uh, those guards had a lot of practice. I bet they're really good at it. Yeah, now. for sure. And Zabiba has quite a bit of influence over the common people because of this. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're the girl um, the king's seeing. Right. She is the common woman who has sway over the king. Right. This is very much a Princess Diana situation. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. much so. Mm-hmm. She's the common person who is courting royalty, but she is staying true to the common people. Right. Yeah. She's looking out for him. Uh, while riding home from the palace one day. Uh, uh, buckle up, by the way. Oh. <clears throat> While riding home from the palace one day, uh, so she she's going home and the king is like, we're planning on divorcing you from a, your husband. Right. And I want to protect you. So I should send you with an armed guard. Makes sense. And she says, no. I can also see that. Yeah. She, she's like, I don't want to be treated like royalty because she despises royalty. But what Even- if they shoot poison bows at you? <laughs> then she'll just drink them really I don't know what I'm saying. It's tea. <laughs> it's, I was trying to make some connection to tea, but it didn't work. Um, while riding home from the palace one day, unguarded, Zabiba is ambushed by armed men in Shutter. masks. 
She draws her sword, which I didn't know she had a fucking sword. That's oh, badass. That's yeah, awesome. Uh, she Good draws she draws her sword to defend herself, but she is quickly disarmed. Wow. Uh, she is pulled off the horse. She is then tied, gagged, and then led off the road to a clearing in the forest. Mm-hmm. The leader of the group takes her a little bit far, you know, away from the, the rest of them. Right. And then beats her, and then rapes her. Zabiba manages to ungag herself in the struggle, and she bites a chunk out of the attacker's neck. Oh, good for her. He beats her even more savagely. Yeah. And then unties her, and then they leave her on the ground. Uh, She's in rough shape. Clearly. Uh, This is nightfall at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Time passed. She's thinking about her ordeal, Uh and she curses the man that did this to her, and she says that he is less than an animal. I agree. And now, okay, this is this is where shit goes off the rails. Oh, this is where <laughs> she starts talking about how even animals will charm a man before copulating with him. I beg your pardon. Yeah, bro. What? <laughs> what are you smoking? And I do. I I kid you not. She starts talking about the bears in the north who would drag men to their caves and then give them berries and cheese so as to entice them into copulation. She means big, strong, hairy gay men, right? No, she's talking about actual bears. But there's a reason for this, and I'll talk I'll talk about it after we finish the book. Yeah, it's a metaphor. I get it. It's another metaphor. Is it Russia? It's Russia. Yes, it's Russia. God damn it. It's it's Russia. Why you gotta bring back episode four of the show? But but literally I'm reading this and I'm like, what? The hell is going on? Yeah. Bears cannot be literally taking men to caves and seducing them. Oh my God. But no, it's just a, it's just a metaphor for Russia and it doesn't tie into her predicament at all. It doesn't fucking make sense in the story if taken literally. Is she saying she would rather have been raped by an animal or is it? No, she's saying that even animals act with some civility and and this man did did it. So he's worse than, so he's worse than an animal. So. And she's making a direct comparison to bears, so she's saying this man is worse than Russia. Right. Wonder who the man and, is. And and I do want to talk about this after the book, but yeah. it, metaphorically, she's saying that in this situation, the man that assaulted her right. is the U.S., the United States, right? And Russia is the bear, and so she's like, even Russia in its assaults of our motherland acted with more civility and dignity than right. the U.S. did, right? right? That's what the author, Saddam Hussein, is saying. For sure. Okay, right? Uh, so Zabiba plans to tell the king all about it, um, but for now she goes home. What? G- um, yep. <laughs> you don't know where those men came from? Follow your own advice and maybe go back to the person who wanted to send you an armed guard. As she walks up to her, her little hut. God damn it. Go on. Uh, she can see through the crack of the door and she sees her husband washing blood from his shoulders. She spits and calls him an infidel under her breath. She she literally I don't remember the word is I didn't write it down. It's translated as asshole. Oh, um, yeah, but I can find that. it literally means uh, rot. I think. Hmm. Hmm. So she calls okay. she calls him rotten, which I think he changed to asshole because calling someone rotten is just kind of laughable in English. Right. Rotten is no longer an insult. Right. It's just like how quaint. Yeah. <laughs> So she's like that fucking asshole, that that devil. She she calls him like a spawn of the devil or something like that. This is an honest question. Yep. Is what he did worse than what he does any other night? Um, no. Because yeah, morally, I'd say no. I, I there's not really a distinction made. Like once she finds out it's him, she's like, ah, uh, okay, I can deal with this, right? Wrong answer, but okay. I mean, that's her attitude yeah, now. Yeah, because she, now she has to be the faithful wife because she knows who it was. Right. So. God damn it. So she cusses at him and then she walks in and she just acts like she doesn't know it's him. Oh, of course. She tells him all about what happened and is distressed. And he like as soon as she walks in, he quickly like ties something around his neck. Hey, can I give you a hickey? And so he is easy. He's, I mean, he's not like empathizing with her or anything. Do you think anyone's ever asked, can I give you a hickey? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Because consent is important. And hickeys are visible. You don't want to be walking around with that, right? Yeah, but I feel like... I, 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 yeah. Also, hickeys, right. hickeys are fucking weird. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get hickeys either. No, like, hickeys like, are usually on the neck. Exactly. That's the joke. And I get kissing the neck and licking the neck. Why are you sucking on the neck? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so much so that you create a hickey. Yeah. People are weird. People are weird, man. Sex is weird. 
It yeah. really is. Yeah. Um, so, so she starts asking him about his neck. Like, oh dear, what happened to you? Where'd you get that ascot? Yeah. What? <laughs> it's lovely. That shade of red is just matches your eyes. Yeah. Um, she's trying to make him squirm. Yeah. For, well, yeah. By like, like, oh, what happened? What happened to your neck? Like what? Alleging she doesn't know anything. Yeah. Why are you hiding it from Asking me? What's very going on? Questions. And so making him very uncomfortable. Yeah. She, she, she describes it as him being possessed by. Uh, a, a demon or something which didn't translate to me he started like crab walking on the ceiling <laughs> i think he was just acting erratically is yeah, what she meant yeah, yeah. no i totally see that. but there's a lot in this book i think that just does not translate so that, that's one yeah. of them uh the next morning she rides back to the palace uh but like before dusk when the sun's not up so mm-hmm. that nobody can see her injuries that'd be dawn so that nobody would notice her injuries uh once in the king's chambers she collapses in his arms sobbing we saw this coming yeah she tells him everything that happened. Everything. And he is pissed the fuck off. For several reasons, I imagine. He's ready to roll some heads. Yeah. Uh, and he immediately orders his men to apprehend Zabiba's husband so that he can be brought to justice. Oh, you got a snake eyes. But Zabi, okay. Th- this, this book is dumb, okay? Clearly. But this part of the book just, it doesn't, I don't want to say it goes off the rails, but it accelerates Way past any form of, like, plot development here. Nice. So Zabiba warns the king that if he does take her husband into custody, yep. then the traitors conspiring against him will assault his palace with a, f- a f- armed force. At least he would know where they are and he can prepare for it. But, but, but this doesn't fucking track. They didn't establish there was any connection between her husband and the conspirators. Right. And they also didn't establish that she knew anything about it. Yeah, and they also didn't establish why the conspirators would give a fuck if one of their own was apprehended. No, we got to get him. That's Chuck. You, I mean, like, just let him die. Like, why? Why are you risking your your conspiracy and just attacking boldfaced? No, we got to go get Chuck. It's so dumb. I don't know why I named him Chuck. But this is what this is what's happening, and the king believes her 100. percent Yeah, naturally, and she's right, of course. Yeah, because why not? Um, she's, I don't know. She's an annoying character. I wouldn't say she's a Mary Sue. Because she doesn't seem to really attempt anything. like She just knows everything that she needs to know. Right. She knows what she needs to know, and she somehow just convinces the king of everything that needs to happen. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the king tells her that he will ready his army and his spies. Nice. Maybe should have done that before. Maybe. Uh, Zabiba says that uh, she will raise up the people so that the enemy will have nowhere to hide. Nice. Maybe should have done that before. I mean, she doesn't elaborate exactly what this means, but uh, I assume it just means that they are going to help them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Turn, sounds like it's going to turn into a witch hunt. Right. She She does go into the city and gathers a bunch of people to help defend the palace. Solid. Which they didn't... <laughs> These people have like little to no motivation to defend the palace but they want to guard zabiba and zabiba's awesome they, they want to help her yeah but look if princess diana came to you and said <sighs> hey somebody's gonna overthrow the king would you help me no i'd be like i'd do anything for you but not for the fucking <laughs> the, the english royalty <laughs> i would fuck them i would say how are you here talking right now because you died like 20 years ago so she goes out grabs a bunch of people in the city and it's like yo let's go back to the crib and fuck up some some traitors allegedly uh together with the king's army um, they defend the palace against the conspirators' attack. This is literally half a page. Oh. This huge battle is half a page of like, uh, and they won. Cool. Also, here's some stuff that happened during the battle. Nice. Zabiba's injured. She's hit by an arrow. Again? Well, uh, the arrow's new. She's been beaten with fists. She's been cut with a sword. Why I, not add an it, arrow it's, in there? It's, it's like when you're chopping wood and a, a log already has a split in it and you hit it with an axe. So she already had a cut down her chest and that arrow hit and it yeah, just split just, her in half. Just basically. right <laughs> Uh, it, How so, satisfying is that feeling though when you hit that right in the It's split? good. Yeah. I, I, the one thing I miss about living in farm country is chopping wood. Yeah. Yeah. It is so zen. It is a great workout. It is therapeutic. It's very nice. I really miss doing that. Um, so she is hit with an arrow and she is taken to the king's chambers. Uh, again. Uh, while lying in bed, she dictates a letter to the king. This is a long fucking letter. Hmm. Like, she supposes that she is dying, so she is giving the king her last words. Right. But it's like four fucking pages. Good lord. And the scribe is like, bro, I'm running out of room on this legal pad. You Hang on a second. <laughs> like, it is, it is a long note. Gotta sand the ink. Uh, in the letter, she accepts his proposal of marriage. Which, I mean, he's still a fucking king. He didn't king. do anything. Uh, yeah, no, whatever. 
Uh, she eventually... She, wait, she said no. She walked home. She got beat up. She came back, told him everything, and then went out to find people to fight his battle, came back, fought his battle, got injured, and now she's ready to marry him. Well, she's dying. So, I mean, might as well go out with a... I want to make you happy. I was going to say, please don't say go out with a bang. <laughs> no, fuck. I wouldn't say that. So she dies of her injuries. Oh, she does. She does. She dies. Oh, wow. Uh, and the, the king succeeds and brings order to his kingdom. And he fulfills her wish and creates a council of the people. Oh, he doesn't step down himself. Oh, no. He's king until he dies. Yeah. And his line doesn't end. Right. But he does create a council of people to look after the social affairs and stuff, right? Mm. He does have, like, the final say in anything they do, which kind of defeats the purpose of a social... <laughs> defeats the purpose of a council of people, right? Oh, my God. So, uh, so uh, like, nothing changed, basically? The rest of this book is so fucking boring and pointless to me that I was, like, skipping pages wholesale. There's, like, 30 pages left in the book. Nice. But the gist of it is uh, there's a couple pages. It's, like, a, a chapter about... Zabiba's legacy. Okay. So they make like a monument to her. They make, they make a, I don't know what the opposite of a monument is. It's like a bad monument to her husband that, <sighs> that people throw rocks at. Nice. Um, and everybody's like Zabiba was the great and Allah is great. Um, there's a very heavy em emphasis toward the end of the book about how awesome Allah, Allah is. Sure. And, uh, just really, really, really heavy religious tones. Yeah. All this good stuff happened in the book. So arguably no good things happened in the book. <laughs> so it's just like happily ever after kind of, even yeah. though virtually nothing changed. And then there's like, there's a solid 20 some pages of just people talking at the council. Oh, so the council forms, people come and voice their grievances sure. and they work it out. Nice. And so it's like a dude who's a landowner and he comes up and he's like, I am not rich, but I am not poor either. And here are my concerns. And people laugh at him. And then he counters with like a bomb ass counter argument. And none of it was interesting and none of it mattered because the story is fucking over. So who gives a shit? Right. Like, is it is it more metaphor or is it kind of it's more like parable? Yeah. Right. So it's not metaphorical because they're talking about literal struggles of the people right. that were applicable to the time the book was written, but none of the situations are real. The people aren't real. So right. it's like a right. fucking parable. Um, and then that that's how it ends is just with these people talking to the council and it was shit. And yeah, she was so close to being a good female lead character. Kind of. She missed it by, I'd say, 50%. She was a very, very fucking obnoxious know-it-all. On the on the attributes that describe a good female character, she was one of those. She was par. She was female. She, <laughs> um, so this book, uh, you know, released two thousand. Yes, it was a bestseller. Sold for fifteen hundred dinars, uh, which is about fifty cents U.S. Sure. The cover art was by Jonathan Bowser, nice. who's a Canadian artist oh. who did not know that his art was stolen. <laughs> oh, the original art, not this portrait of Saddam Hussein. Yeah, not the portrait, the original cover art okay, was, was yeah. just wholesale ripped from his, his wow. gallery, uh, which is hilarious. Like, why can't you just fucking buy some art for it? Why <laughs> like, would he? He's king. I guess. He just doesn't give a shit. Yeah, I do what I want. Um, so the one of the very disappointing things about this book is that, so the, the, the CIA analyzed this book when it came out. Oh, yeah, for sure. They dissected the shit out of this book. And according to them, it is very likely, it is very probable that it was not written by Saddam Hussein. Interesting. He definitely supervised the writing of this book, but there was a lot of information about him hiring ghostwriters to write a bunch of different books, but this was the only one that he himself put his name on. Sure, sure. So there okay. are a lot of other propaganda books of the same flavor out there, but they have the actual author's names on them. Right. But this one, there's a whole insert at the beginning of the book of the author it was the author saying that I wanted to put Saddam's name on this because he's cool and I like him and I don't want to take credit for this, even though I wrote it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's weird. So allegedly Saddam hired this guy to write this book and this guy then said, I don't want to take credit for this. Saddam Hussein wrote this. The, his name is, I'm going to say this wrong. I apologize. Najib Kujur. Sure. 
It, it literally says, uh, this brilliant idea inspired uh, Najib Gujar, one of the honorable sons of Iraq, and as a result came into the existence this novel, and yet the reader holding his hands right now. And then it just says, like, I, want, I wanted to put Saddam's name on it because hmm. I, lo- I love him. So, yeah, that was very disappointing when I learned that. It is not actually written by Saddam, even though I'm sure Saddam had an outline and he's like, I want the book to have this. And I'm sure he says he wrote it. Yes. And uh, he advertises it as written by him. Probably also like read, read to and approved by him. Yes, absolutely. This book had glowing reviews in Iraq when it came out. I wonder why. I wonder why. Um, there, I think there was literally one critic who said it was entirely boring and incomprehensible. Okay. I'm with him. I don't know what happened to him. I assume he just disappeared. Probably. <laughs> uh, but that's, that is exactly the words that I would describe this book is like boring and, boring incomprehensible. and incomprehensible. So let's look at some of the metaphors and parallels yes. to real life scenarios. So in 1991, mm-hmm. uh, it was during this time uh, that the Iraqi forces were invading Kuwait. Okay. And several nations, including the U.S., moved forces into Kuwait to push Iraq back, right? right? This was Operation Desert Storm. Right. The parallel here is the abusive husband. Zabiba's husband is the United States. Mm -hmm. And his act of raping her out in the forest is Desert Storm. Okay. Okay. Because Iraq and Kuwait had a good relationship. I'm assuming Kuwait is the woman. No. the, the, The Zabiba represents the Iraqi people. Okay. 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 Yep. Took it the other step. Yeah. So, um, Kuwait doesn't really figure in here they're the forest um they're the forest (laughs) uh so yeah and and, uh of course the king is hussein of course obviously right um he considers himself a wise and good ruler even though you can see his twisted fucked up morality in this book yes in his way of thinking um the bears who drag people to their caves and seduce them (laughs) that is russia which you correctly guessed i was i was impressed I, to be fair, I did know that this was an allegorical and or metaphorical and or parabolic tale going into it. Right. So I was looking for it the whole time and there's a bear is only one thing. And there are other parallels that are not so obvious. I think there was a parallel between the queen and one of Saddam's like compatriots or something mm-hmm, who felt mm-hmm. jealous or something. There, there, there's a lot of those. But um, th- those are the main ones that people point out is like uh, Desert Storm and all that shit. And th- this whole book is the, like it's very obvious that you are made to feel for the king he is the main character and you you you're supposed to feel empathetic for him right obviously i did not because he has no concept of what an actual person feels right he's a fucking he he wobbles between being a monster and a complete dumbass yeah <laughs> sometimes both and yeah sometimes both he's a monstrous dumbass the Zabiba is not a relatable character. She's not an interesting character. She is barely a character. She literally just informs the king about shit, and then awful stuff happens to her. She is there to be used. Yes. Which is very denotative of women in that society. Yeah. I mean, a lot of societies, but that society. It's just, really, it's just, the whole thing is fucking awful. It's even worse than a plot device. So let, let's, let's hurry on, let's hurry on to the rating. At the end of each of our episodes, we have a rating system, and you probably know it by now, but uh, the first step is toilet paper. It is only worth the page it's printed on, if that. Second step is a shampoo bottle. It is there if you want to read it. It's something to read if you have nothing else. There is an Ikea manual, which is competent, well-written, maybe, but not entertaining. There is a Kindle pick, which is it's worth picking up, maybe discount store or buying electronically. And then there is a hardcover, which is an instant classic, something that you must own. So, anti-vaxxer, <laughs> how are you feeling about giving yourself that name? Uh, I, f- I feel very conflicted because I wanted to do the gag, but then I fucking hate anti-vaxxers. It's an interesting gag, but you are not, in fact, an anti-vaxxer. No, I, no very, very much not so. Yeah. Um, but for this book, what, what do you think I would give it? I'm going to say you would give it. I'd say maybe an Ikea manual, maybe a shampoo bottle, depending, because it doesn't seem very well written, but it is interesting in its metaphors, but it is a bad book. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I don't find the metaphors interesting at all. Okay. I think they're just very dumb. 
Sure. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. Right. There's there's nothing subtle about this book. Right. There is nothing artful about this book. Right. There's nothing interesting about this book. Well, the only artful thing about the book was stolen. Exactly. That was like one of the few things that I liked about the book. Was like, oh, that cover art is really cool. I wish I had that. And then I learned the story. I'm like, oh fuck, Saddam Hussein. <laughs> we can all. Man, now I don't like him. Hey, yeah, fuck Saddam Hussein. It was stealing art. So there, 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 there's really, really, really nothing about this book that no redeeming characteristics. No, it really not. And I, I was re- like, this has been the most disappointing book for me so far because this book is kind of a meme. Right, it is, and it people think kind of highly of it. Well, no, <laughs> in a sense, I don't think anybody thinks highly of it. They, they in the sense that they ascribe. I think let me explain that the circles that I've seen the book in enjoy it as the metaphor and the ramblings of a madman. Okay, yeah, I can see that they they can they can appreciate it for the madness that it is. Yes, and that when I say highly, that's what not that they think it's a good book, right? But it is. It's a unique book. Yes. Yes. That's a good way to put it. That's a very good way to put it. Um, I, I cannot share that fondness. I have no, f- no, I don't like this. I don't like anything about this book. Um, I, I am very, very, I, I find anything that is anything that smells of manipulation. Yes. Or propaganda. Just absolutely revolting. I, I hate it. I would, th- there, there are parts in this book that reminded me of that movie that was called, uh, God is not dead. Oh yeah. yeah Did yeah. you ever see that? Yeah. That movie to me was like really manipulative and it was like one big straw man for atheism, which is like, well, if you, if you claim you don't believe in God, it's just because you're angry at him. And right. it's like, well, right. no, people li- really don't believe there's a God. <laughs> like, right. And the whole what fucking moron wrote this. Yeah. Yeah, and the whole it, yeah, and that and this this kind of felt that way in the 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 Islamic side of it. Whenever they talked about Allah or any of that thing, it was re- it just felt really slimy and manipulative. He's the best thing there is. And then all the political shit was super 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 boring. Yeah, and the the book was almost like a college essay word count thing, oh, where yeah. they repeated a lot of shit, like her talking to the king about integrating himself with the people and getting to know them. Right, right. That's like, there's like fucking 50 pages of just that, them talking about that. I was getting kind of sick of hearing it. Yes. And it was, it was very, very, very fucking boring. So I absolutely give this a toilet paper. Nice. I, I know it's a meme, but that meme is predicated on the belief that Saddam Hussein wrote this himself, which is not true. Right. So that magic is gone. Right. <laughs> it is literally just a piece of... Propaganda, uh, like political and religious propaganda right. to suit Saddam Hussein's goals. That is literally all this is. There's nothing artful. There's nothing creative. It's, it's absolute shit. And I cannot say enough bad things about this. Nice. So, yeah, don't don't read it. Don't buy it. Uh, so if you guys want to get in touch with us, we have an email. It's uh, a page too far at gmail.com. That's a page T-O-O far at gmail.com. Yep. We also have socials. We have Instagram and Twitter, uh, which you can message us on as well. And we take uh, all of our feedback, uh, good or bad, through our socials as well as email. Um, Let us know if you liked this episode uh, or if you've read the book, what you think of the book, what you think of Saddam Hussein, what you think of the war in Iraq. I mean, we we don't need to hear about the war in Iraq stuff. But you know what? It's whatever you want to send us. Hey, we'll read it. We may not read it on the air. Right. (laughs) We'll definitely see it. We have a Patreon. We have yes. a lot of shit that will be on our Patreon. <laughs> yes, we're working on a lot of projects right now. They'll come up over the next few months. At the lowest tier, you get episodes a day early. You get to listen to them before anybody else. 24 hours, and it won't let me schedule any different. In addition to that, you get outtakes. You know, not everything that we say in an episode makes it into the final cut. The best parts get compiled into a set of outtakes every month, which will be approximately five to ten minutes of just us fucking up. We're talking about random shit, maybe something cringy, maybe something really funny, but not suitable for the main feed. Maybe some anecdotes that just kind of took too long, so we cut them out of the episode. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of those. There, this episode, there's going to be a lot of those anecdotes cut Yeah, in particular. So, the next tier up, you get a bonus episode every month. We do mm-hmm. one additional episode that's extra long, extra juicy, has less cut out of it. 
Uh, and we're, we're less cautious because it's on the Patreon. So we don't have to worry so much about, uh, offending casual listeners or not getting into the nitty gritty of things, right? They're very different. We, we very much nitpick these, yes. these extra, these extra bonus episodes. They are fantastic. They're so much fun to do, but they're just too long to do for like normal content. Right. They're kind of exhausting. <laughs> they are exhausting. They're absolutely exhausting. I mean, you get a three hour episode. That means we recorded for four hours. Yeah. At least not to mention the time editing. Yeah, for every hour, for every produced hour of this podcast, it takes me five to six hours of editing. Yes. That is not a joke. No, and that is why I love you wholeheartedly. <laughs> that, that's a part-time job. So I have to sacrifice a lot of time in order to produce this show. And also, in addition to that, is the hours we have to spend reading and researching right. for the episode. The last episode that I had to read a book for, I went through five books before right. I could find a book suitable for an episode for the regular feed. <laughs> it happens. It happens a lot. We've we've both done that. That is something. It's some. We love doing it. We love. I mean, don't get us wrong. It's fun. we love reading for the show. It is fun. Sometimes sometimes books are just good, and we do occasionally cover just good books. A lot of the good books that we cover have issues, but I think no book is perfect. We also have to spend money on these books in order to read them. We so. Do. Any sort of support on our Patreon is vastly appreciated. The more support we have, the easier it is for us to produce the show and the better content we can create because we have more time to do that and we have more options as far as books go. More availability. Yeah, that yep. sort of thing. So any support at all is vastly appreciated. Um, but if you can't afford it, don't worry about it. They'll look out for yourself. Exactly. We appreciate your support. We love your support. We need your support. But uh, if you can't support, don't feel guilty. Uh, That's all the time we have for today's episode. Yeah. Uh, hashtag Bobo lives. Hashtag Bobo lives. Bye-bye.